Okay, awesome. So we're going to get started here. Thanks for joining us. And uh, we have our esteemed professor, Dr. Constantine Balanis, uh, to present to you on electromagnetics. Am I on? You're on. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, let me put this on. Okay, hold on. Okay, let, let me go back over here. Okay. Okay, area. Uh, let me see. I don't know why this. Here we go. Now, now I can go. Let me go back to the beginning. Uh, here we go. Um, electrical, computer, and energy engineering pathways, electromagnetics area. Uh, again, the school. Arizona State University, and the presenter, me. Constantine Balanis, Regents Professor Emeritus of Electrical Engineering since January 11th, in the 2021. And those of you that never seen me, that this is the man. What's electromagnetics? Electromagnetics is the study of electric charges at rest. We call that static fields. That's what ASU is the course EEE 241 that everybody has to take all in electrical engineering, whether you follow the EM pathways or not, you have to take the 241. Or electric charges in motion, we call that time varying fields. You get part of that at towards the end of 241 and uh, all of, of 341. 341 is one that goes in, um, in the electromagnetic pathway uh, discipline area, uh, have to take it in order to be able to take some of the uh, other courses, uh, senior electives, <laughs> excuse me, graduate level and so forth. However, it's available for those that do not follow the EM pathway. So electromagnetics is described basically by a set of four Maxwell's classic Maxwell equations. We call those Maxwell's equations. They're both in integral and differential form. And some of the classes that you take in the circuits and geometrical optics, uh, physical optics, uh, a special case of Maxwell's equation. Okay, Maxwell lived in the 1800s, uh, 1831 to 1879 in Scotland. Well-known figure, those are the famous classic Maxwell's equation in integral form. That's the first one, that's it. And this is the second one and two other, oops, let me go back over here, uh, two other ones. The first one in circuits is nothing but the loop equations. When you do loop equations to solve a circuit problem, that's a, an, a approximation to the first equation. When you, knew, when you do node equations in circuits, that's the application of the second equation. That's exact what you're doing. What we're doing in circuits is an approximation. One of the terms in that equation is left out because in circuits, low frequency circuits, that contribution is very small. So it's usually deleted. Why electromagnetics? I don't know what the other people will tell you or have told you, EM is the basis of electrical engineering. All other ones are special cases. By the way, just for your own information, IEEE has within electrical engineering, the 39 societies. That's how versatile, how broad electrical engineering is. There are 39 societies, 39 transactions publications that each one of the societies so, uh, publishes. So that's how versatile, how uh, basic electrical engineering is in electromagnetics. So the fundamental, fundamental and challenging problems, wireless communication, packaging of mobile units, stealth technology, and so forth. We'll show you a uh, few applications Go through it to solve complex problems. 
and practical problems using what we call full wave solutions. When you use Maxwell's equation without leaving out any terms, we call that uh, full wave solutions. And we treat the problem as a distributive, not an approximation with lumped elements like we do in circuits. So we model and simulate devices using full, that's what we call full wave solvers. We have a plethora of uh, solvers, software, commercial and personal that used in electromagnetics to model and simulate simple and complex problems. And that's what I mean here, other. Here, we have some of the devices that we're all aware of and going back to the first generation, you know, the when the antennas were exterior, like the, the Motorola StarTAC, and uh, we have the Walker Talkie, and of course then the antennas were, um, were placed internally, in, were embedded within the chassis, as we see towards the last three devices. And so those are some of the devices that you can use full wave simulators based on Maxwell's equation to be able to simulate, analyze them and be able to uh, do design problems. There's some other ones. You can see here the stealth aircraft. We'll talk about that. Uh, so why well, study electromagnetics, analyze model, antennas, RF, microwave circuits, fiber optics, electronic packaging, electromagnetic interference, electromagnetic compatibility, and so forth. Plethora of applications. Now let's get to what may be of interest to all of you to be successful in the electromagnetics related courses. What you must have, what your background should be. You should have a solid foundation on mathematics. So part of it's part of electrical engineering or all of electrical engineering, especially electromagnetics. It's mathematically based. You saw the equations. Those were all in integral form. We have them in differential form. Physics, we have been exposed. When you get physics, you will be exposed to some of the uh, electromagnetic. Uh, formulations, uh, maybe even Maxwell's equation, circuits, special cases of Maxwell's equation. So you need to have a solid foundation of those three areas. If you, have a if you do that, I guarantee you, you'll be very successful in electrical engineering. Just to give you something which uh, happened to me when I was a freshman, I did not know exactly what do I wanted to do. So I actually, I was enrolled in mathematics. And at the end of my uh, freshman year, I switched to uh, I switch into electrical engineering because electrical is more application of the mathematics. It's easier to get a job, for example. Okay, what are some of the courses? As I indicated already, everybody in electrical engineering must take 241. Fundamentals of Electrical Engineering is usually taught fall, spring, maybe even in summertime. Is that about it? Uh, the Electrical Engineering Office will tell you when it's available, but it definitely over, based on past record, been available fall, spring, summertime. And what do we study? Statics mostly, and towards the end, time varying vector fields. Boundary value problems, dielectric magnetic material, Maxwell's equation, of course, and boundary conditions. Because to solve the Maxwell's equation, which are differential equations, you need boundary conditions because there's some unknowns. And you need the boundary conditions to be able to determine what those unknowns are. And prerequisites, the 241, electrical engineering 202, which is a circuit class, physics 101, I want, excuse me, 131, and I think 132, I, I believe it's a uh, corresponding lab for physics 131. 
How about other undergraduate EM courses? I already talked about the 241. It's the gateway required course to, to re-emphasize. Um, 341 is the one, again, it's part of the EM pathway. And again, it's available to everybody, but it's definitely required though so we will follow the AM pathway. We study time varying electromagnetic fields. Uh, we talk about transmission lines. We talk about radiation. We talk about resonators. We talk about antennas. Um, it's a pathway course required for EM majors, but others can take it. And I recommend that you take it. In fact, some of the others like in solid state, for example, can benefit from taking this course. Prerequisite, of course, is the previous one, the 241. How about senior elective courses? One is antenna course, the first antenna course, it's EEE 443. And we cover some of the Fundamental parameters, we examine classic elements like dipole, loops, arrays, smart antennas, microstrips, also some measurements. Then there's a course in microwaves, 445. Talk about devices, sources, impedance matching measurements, very, very, very important. And not only that prerequisite to some of the courses that follow especially at, at the advanced level, graduate level courses that we will show you in just a few minutes. And then we have a fiber optics course, senior elective 448, principles of fiber optic communication. Professor Palais primarily has been teaching the course yeah, for, many, for many years. Graduate level courses. I can tell you based on my experience and knowledge, of many other universities throughout the country and the world, we have a set of plethora of graduate level courses which are taught basically continuously, not necessarily all of them every year, but at least every couple of years. Like 540, 541, very popular. It's usually been, have been, has been taught the last decade or so every year. Uh, 543 is the follow-up course to 443, second semester course in antennas. So 545 is a follow-up course to 445, graduate level course in circuits, um, and microwave circuits, excuse me. Uh, we have fiber optics courses like coherent optics, lasers. So we have an expanded list of courses graduate level in the 500 level, but we also have some in the 600 level, 641, 643, 647. Some of the first couple of them are advanced courses in electromagnetic theory. The last one is an advanced course in microwave solid state circuit design. Graduate school. Well, you can decide I and mean, you should seriously consider for a master's of science in electrical engineering. Now, the, that degree is somewhat specialized. It more, it's more applications oriented and it's very marketable degree pursuing a career in industry or government. PhD, very specialized, you choose an area in electrical engineering. And remember we have 39 areas. And you hook, you hook up, connect with a faculty member that you have a mutual interest. And you basically spent three, four years, nothing but pursuing that particular topic. This kind of degree is what we call uh, on research and development, R&D. And if you have aspirations, and you should, for position in teaching, especially at the university level, you must 
nowadays must have a PhD degree. Career opportunities, many. Academia, I just finished talking about. You need a PhD degree. Teaching, what do you do? What we have that we're doing, you know, some of us have been in academia. I've been in academia for 50 and a half years, started in 1970, full time. Before that, I worked for NASA six years from 64 to 70. And then I started full time teaching in 1970, 13 years at West Virginia University, 37 and a half years at ASU. What do you do? Teach, you do research, you have to write. Proposals, papers, supervise graduate students. You can do some consulting as time permits. Industry, government, all three degrees. Right now, companies, they cannot find enough electrical engineers. Remember, electrical engineer, most versatile engineering. Take it from me. 56 and a half year of experience talking right now. Applications, electromagnetics, antennas, microwaves, RF and microwave communication system, radar, remote sensing, fiber optics, electronic packaging, and others. Companies locally, we have a plethora of companies, <coughs> excuse me, major, High profile companies, Intel, Boeing. We used to have Motorola here locally. We used to employ 19 to 20,000 people, the largest employer in Arizona at that time. Honeywell, you name it. So, anywhere you go, any city, you will see companies that need electrical engineers. So here's the job opportunities. I have listed some of the major companies, Boeing, General Dynamics in Scottsdale, but it used to be, it used to be Motorola, Government Electronics Group, Northrop Grumman, L3 Communicate, Lockheed Martin, and we'll show you just in a few minutes, Lockheed Martin have designed some of the stealth aircraft, Motorola, Motorola still around, not at the level they used to be. Intel, of course, has a large presence in Arizona, down in Chandler. Rocco International, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, for example, <coughs> as well as California. Raytheon in Tucson, Honeywell, northwest part of the valley here, Texas Instrument, primarily mostly in other places, but uh, in Texas, <clears throat> IBM, major. IBM used to be the second best company to work for when I graduated back in 1960s. Qualcomm, Cal Bell Helicopters, and so forth. You're not gonna be out of a job, I can tell you that. They're gonna come after you. Government, NASA, I worked for them six years, 64, 70. The Army, Navy, Air Force. In fact, the Army and the Navy, I had a consortium for 28 years here at ASU. They were funding us in research. The many Army installations spread around the, uh, the country. NSA, National Security Agency outside of Washington, D.C., JPL in California. San Diego Corporation, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Aerospace Corporation in California. So, and many others. Facilities. We have a facility which we call Electromagnetic and Echoic Chamber, one of the top two such facilities in the country at a university setting. This goes back to the mid 1980s. Became operational. I came here in 83. I think we had it designed, built about 1985. And we got to support the many uh, companies, including the university. The government gave us, we had a proposal, we got funded to be able to build this facility. Unique, 
We have some other facilities. Wireless communication, circus land, a couple of different views of this particular lab, laboratory, including a screen chamber to the right. Another one is laboratory to measure material properties, wave material interactions. Faculty, uh, and I have them listed alphabetically. Uh, Professor Eberly, some of you may have already seen him. I'm sure before you graduate, you will see him. You will take a class from him. Myself, okay, and I also show the universities where each one of them had gotten their uh, doctorate and a PhD degree, myself at Ohio State. Professor Imani is a new professor in electrical engineering, PhD in, in the University of Michigan. I'm sure you're going to see him, uh, take classes from him. Uh, professor Pillay is director of graduate studies, got his PhD, University of Michigan. George Penn, University of Kansas, again, most likely you will take classes from him. And last but not least, Professor Tricopoulos, PhD from the Ohio State University. So I think you will see here that out of the six faculty, two have gotten PhD from Ohio State and two from the University of Michigan. Those two universities in the past and even now were considered to be leading universities in electromagnetics. Now here's a photo of Professor Eberly. Again, I'll repeat some of the information. Uh, his PhD advisor was Dave Pozar, and those of you that may take classes in microwave 445, I think we're using uh, Dr. Pozar's book on uh, microwaves, who was uh, Professor Abrams' advisor. Uh, Professor Abrams has been here since 1989. These are the research areas, which includes antennas, computational EM, metamaterials, RF and microwave circuits, and software defined radio and so forth, has extensive experience, spent a little bit of time also in industry, mostly in academia. And you can find more information concerning um, Dr. Eberly with his uh, website, uh, which is shown at the, at the end of this view graph. Uh, here are some schematics of uh, circuits that, uh, Professor Eberly is interested in, like software defined radio. This is electrically small antennas, and these are circuits on passive sensors for nuclear detection and non foster reactances. Here's me. Again, I've been at the issue since 1983. Recently retired as of January the 11th of this year. Um, uh, research interest in computational EM, high impedance surfaces. I will talk about that a little bit later, a little bit more. Holographic high impedance surfaces for pattern control and beam scanning. Um, and already alluded to the fact that I worked for NASA, worked also uh, consulting for government industry, taught courses for government industry. Again, been in academia for 50 and a half years. More information, you can go to this uh, website of mine. Professor Imani is a new at ASU. I think this is second year, a PhD in the University of Michigan. Those are his area of research, electromagnetics, advanced electromagnetic circuits, antenna theory, microwave circuits, and engineering, metamaterials, some other topics that may, may not be included here. And you can get more, more information by contacting Professor Imani, Imani directly. Uh, Professor Pillay probably is the most senior faculty member in electrical engineering. <clears throat> he was here when I first came here. Um, got a PhD as mentioned in uh, University of Michigan. He's director of graduate studies in electrical engineering. So if you have some interest in that, you probably have to communicate, you have to talk to him. The, primarily he's doing teaching and most of his classes are in 
optical communication, optical electromagnetics, like 448, uh, 546, 548, and 549. Again, if you want some description of those courses, you can go to this particular website shown at the bottom of this view graph. Professor Pan, got his PhD at the University of Kansas. He also has interest, obviously, in electromagnetic, computational EM, high speed package, high speed electronic packaging, magnetic resonant imaging, inverse scattering, millimeter wave and antenna systems, rough surface scattering. I think maybe that's the topic. I believe that he may. He did his PhD dissertation, I believe, at the University of Kansas. Professor Tricopo has been around with us um, for about four or five years. He came to us from Ohio State University. He's primarily interested in millimeter and terahertz systems, terahertz frequencies. Here are some specific topics. Um, terahertz imaging, for example, near field imaging for biometric sensing, terahertz metrology, a couple of the instruments in those particular areas, in cameras for imaging purposes. He has uh, some experience with industry, but mostly in academia and some of the companies that he has been affiliated with in the past. Again, you can go to his website and find more information, I'm sure. During your tenure, in electrical engineering, you will have to see him, you have to take classes from him, talk to him, maybe even work for him at the graduate level. Let me just be a little more specific now, some research projects. I'm only gonna talk about uh, those that I know mostly about. Um, in particular, RCS reduction using checkerboard high impedance surfaces. RCS stands for Radar cross section. We talk about how talk about the visibility of a target to the radar. That's what the parameter that we use to identify and describe how visible this a given radar target is. We use the uh, term RCS, radar cross section, uh, and low profile antennas. Low profile conformal antennas, holographic multi layer sur surfaces. How you synthesize some of these high impedance surfaces, by the way, which do not exist in nature. They have to be synthesized, they're artificial, but they have properties, very attractive characteristics. And that's why we have so much interest, not only here at ASU, but throughout the country, throughout the world in particular. Conformal. Conformal meaning they don't have to be on a flat surfaces to be curved, for example. So this synthesize artificial magnetic conductors, AMCs, high impedance surfaces, they have many names. Sometimes they usually refer to as meta materials, meta surfaces. If you follow the literature, you will see this buzzwords, meta materials, meta surfaces. For scattering, low profile antennas, at least in my case. So I'm gonna talk a little bit because of time limitations. I'm gonna talk about the EM scattering control. Also, I can talk about low profile antennas, but they're time limited. <clears throat> but if there's some questions, we, we can um, talk about that topic. I have some extra view graph towards the end of the presentation, but. I will primarily initially stay with the topic of EM scattering control. Now let's take, for example, some classic elements like a dipole, which is linear dipole, just a straight wire, a loop antenna, as I'm showing here, and a spiral. Those are the three from top to bottom. And they're mounted, then placed horizontally above what we call PEC, perfect electric conductor. That, that means it metallic surfaces, metallic ground planes. These are not, these PECs, those elements, when they're mounted on such 
surface, you see surfaces, are not very attractive because as we, as we change the height, especially when we make the height zero, we place it right on the surface, those elements do not radiate. And I will show you on the next view graph, why not? What we want is to have the same elements, for example, but placed above what we refer to as PMC, <clears throat> perfect magnetic conductors, perfect, ma ma perfect magnetic conducting surfaces or ground planes, uh, meta surfaces, whatever you want to call it. But those surfaces do not exist in, in nature. Question is, they have a very attractive characteristics. So the question is, can we synthesize such surfaces? By the way, in electromagnetics, you will see that PEC surfaces are classified as surfaces where the tangential components of the electric field vanish. Those are the boundary conditions on the surface. PMC are where the magnetic fields, tangential magnetic field vanishes on the surface. That's the classic boundary conditions which uh, identifies these surfaces or discriminates between one and the other one. Now, let me show you why. Now, if we take, for example, a vertical dipole linear element, as I'm showing here, we place it above a PEC surface. So what do we have here? We have a direct radiation from the element, and then we have reflections from the PEC surface and to account for the reflections, we introduce an image. Again, those of you, we may already have taken 241 and maybe even 341. We talk about imaging to take into account, to account for the reflections from surfaces. What happens is you can see both the actual element and the image. The image is shown, you know, dotted, for example. The contributions add. So we get efficiency. Efficiency is high, but such an element is not low profile. In other words, especially when you want to design a surface which has low visibility to the radar or a surface which has aerodynamics, uh, don't have drag, do not introduce drag then that kind of surface, that kind of element is not, is not attractive, is not what we refer to as low profile. So we're gonna eliminate that. Suppose now we take a horizontal element, we put above a PEC to account for the reflections, the image is in the opposite direction. So the contribution from the direct element and from the image, they have construct they, they form construct destructive interference instead of constructive like they did on the number one. So efficiency is down, but it is low profile. So that's out. So let's look at the third one. Suppose we have again a horizontal electric element like we've shown here. Now we're going to put above PMC surface, which does not exist in nature. But if we apply the boundary conditions to account for the reflections, the image is in the same direction as the actual element. So the contribution from the actual element and that from the image form a constructive interference. So efficiency is high because it's horizontally mounted. It's also low profile, very attractive. However, PMCs do not exist in nature. Well, not so fast. Based on the ingenuity of engineers and scientists, physicists, electrical engineers, been able to the last 20 some years to be able to synthesize or to form engineering texture surfaces which have characteristics similar to those of PNC. What is that surface? Well, when you take a substrate, which includes, as I'm showing here, includes a ground plane, PC, ground plane. Then it has a dielectric. And above that, you put some patches of different configurations. Here I'm showing, for example, square patches. 
metallic, and then metallic patches. And then those are connected with what we refer to as vias, posts. Well, that kind of, this kind of a surface, if you place something on the characteristics of it, when you're looking at it from the top, has properties very similar to PMC surfaces. And I'll show you that in just a second. Very attractive. That's, that was the kind of overall view. This is top view. Again, you can see the patches. Now they have to be designed properly. It looks simple, but it's not simply. Okay. Now, if you were to illuminate, let me go back to this surface <clears throat> at normal incidence, perpendicular, you send in a, illuminate with a plane wave and you get a reflections, reflection coefficient. If you plot the phase of the reflection coefficient at normal incident versus frequency. And this, uh, we have two simulations. You're using a, a, the most popular electromagnetic commercial software we call HFSS, High Frequency System Simulator, and some approximate design equations. One is the black curve, the other one is the dashed red curve. If we look that the, the phase uh, versus frequency varies from plus 90, which is about 10 gigahertz, to minus 90, about 14 gigahertz. And at the center frequency, about 12 gigahertz, the phase is zero. Well, at zero frequency with the phase, when the phase of the reflection coefficient is zero, it's an ideal, a perfect PMC surface. However, when the phase is between 90 to plus 90 and minus 90, it's nearly a PMC surface, is usable in that frequency range. So you can see this frequency range, we call, which I call delta F, is the frequency range over which this type of a surface that can be used as a PMC surface. We call it electromagnetic band gap, EBG, electromagnetic band gap, because it's only functions as a PMC only in a gap of the frequency range, electromagnetic band gap, EBG. So let's see how we can use this type of a surface. For example, many applications, uh, including low profile antennas, but I'm gonna talk about here a little bit because of time limitations. RCS reduction, in other words, to, to reduce the visibility. Suppose we have a target, which is flat, okay? It's very visible to the radar. Is there anything we can do using this kind of a surface to reduce its visibility to the radar? Okay, that's what we're gonna do right now. Stealth technology, I guess you can classify that as. Suppose we take a plate, flat plate, conductor, metallic, and we illuminate it with a plane wave at an angle like this, incident field. The scattered field is in a direction shown here by the red arrow, and the maximum Scattered field is in a direction which we call the specular direction. Specular according to Snell's law of reflection. It's when the angle of scattering, theta sub s, is equal to the incident angle, theta sub r. Okay, now suppose we take a flat plane, metallic. We illuminate it normally, orthogonal incidence perpendicular. And we have introduced scattering from it. A typical scattering pattern. It's shown here. It's a sync function, sine x over x type of a distribution. Most of the energy is in the direction in which it came from when you illuminate at normal incidence, perpendicular incidence. In other words, when you go back, if you illuminate at normal incidence, as shown by the blue arrow, the maximum is in the same direction, very visible. Now, this is just flat metallic surface, very visible. Is there anything we can do to reduce its visibility in that direction? And the answer is yes, by using this artificial 
synthesized surfaces that we're just talking about. Well, before I get to that, let me just talk about design of stealth type of radar targets. We saw that the flat, flat plate is very visible. Suppose we take a corner reflector as shown here, we illuminate it again, normal incidence. What happens if you apply Snell's law of reflection, which you learn in physics, you learn in 241. What happened? The, the reflected fields are not in the same direction in, in which the incident field was. You, you direct it away from the receiver, the radar receiver. So you make it less visible as shown here. Okay, you see this scattering, reflections away. Suppose you have a convex, by the way, they have to be convex, not concave. When we look at from the outside surface, convex. Same thing with a curved surface as shown here. Illuminated like this, what happens? The fields are not in <clears throat> scattered field, not in the, in the direction in which the incoming field was. So you make it less visible to the radar. All right. Well, let me just show you some actually, uh, actually radar targets was built based on those two concepts. Here is the F-117, like in, they're called Nighthawk. This was built in 1980s, early 1980s. Look what it looks like. Bunch of corner reflectors, corner bent plates. They call it faceted plates. Okay, that's near its tenure as I understand. And because of its low visibility and in my book on electro advanced electromagnetics, which some of you may, if you take 541 or 641, the, the second edition, the cover, I have a picture of that one. Of course, to use it, I have to get, a, I have to get a, a permission from Lockheed at that time. And I can tell you they were, very forward, provide me the, the a photograph of that and give me the permission. It happened within a day. I remember exactly when it happened. No hesitations. Okay, that's based on the using corner reflectors. How about a smooth surfaces? Yeah, this most modern stealth type of aircraft, F-35, I think the, Air Force version of that is at Luke Air Force Base on the west part of the valley. Again, based on curved surfaces, mostly, to make it less visible. Just to show you, and this, by the way, these numbers are uh, not necessarily exact. This was published in 1988, I believe. I'll show you that in a minute in uh, our Triple E publication. Show you some typical radar targets, like from trucks, automobiles, commercial aircraft, and uh, birds, insects, uh, advanced tactical fighters. The RCS, the radar cross the parameter, which tells you how visible this target is to the radar. By the way, it is proportional to area, let's say meter square. But if you compare those values, okay, to one meter square, we use one meter square as the reference, then we can convert that to dB, dB per square meter, dBSM, that's what dBSM stands for. Now we're taking the 20, for example, divided by one, we make it, dim I'm sorry, let's take the first one, pickup truck, RCS in meter square is 200. You divide by one meter square, we make that dimensionless, 200. Convert that to decibels. It's equivalent to 23 dB, dB per square meter, because we normalize it relative to one meter square. Just to show you some of them, I can go through all of them, but let's take a jumbo jetliner. RCS in meter square is about 100. Divide by one. Make it dimensionless, convert that to dB, 20 dBSM, quite visible. Let's go to a bird, typical bird, for example. The, the RCS in dBSM is minus 20. So there's a 40 dB difference 
between the bird and the jumper jetliner. But to show you an advanced tactical aircraft that maybe today, this is as of 1988, I'll show you, I'll give you the reference in a minute, 22. That's minus 60 dBSM. So the bird is more visible than this advanced tactical aircraft. This was published in 1988 in Atropoli Spectrum. It's one of the publications by Atropoli that everybody, mem every member of the Atropoli gets in. Some guy, Adams, Adam, how to design an invisible aircraft, April 1988. Again, don't take that as the Bible. Okay? Those are uh, approximate, okay? Because the actual figures, special for some of these radar targets are classified. Nobody knows, only those people that worked on them. We don't have the, that information available, but they're pretty good numbers. And today's, like the F-35, may be even less visible than the minus 60 dBSM. Now, all right, those are examples. If we take the flat blade, what can we do to reduce its visibility? We saw it was very visible. Suppose we put a, what we call, we cover the blade with, and make it look like a checkerboard. We have, these high impedance surfaces of different designs as I'm showing over here. We have four by four, one we call EBG, electromagnetic band gap one, and the other one electromagnetic band gap two, or you can go meta material one, meta surface one, meta surface two. So we have so many different de designations, see? And we published some of this in, with my students over here in, 2015, yeah, we, we built one, we fabricated here at ASU in our anechoic chamber, we measured it. That's what it looks like, I got one here in my office. You can see them. When you illuminate this target, you can see that the, the, its visibility has been reduced. You can say, how? How can this happen? It's flat. Well, here there is the, this checkerboard surface, we illuminate it with, a wave is scattering. You can see we, we, we directed the scattered field away from the direction the field came from. Remember the field came at normal incidence, now is directed at four, the major, major, the maximum of the major lobes, we call those lobes, is away from the direction it came from. And one is at 45 degrees, uh, the other one is 135 and then 90 degrees all the way around. That's what, that's what the scatter field, the pattern of the scatter field looked like. Why did it happen like that? How? Well, let me we'll show you that in a minute. Again, another paper that we published in, in 2015. What happens is when you illuminate this checkerboard surface and normal incidence, each one of those EPG surfaces, we induce in them current density. And you can see the current density in each one of them is different from that of the other one, of the other ones, I should say, see? So we have formed what we refer to as an array, a planar array of elements, another publication, March 2020. So, so what do we have over here? We have a four by four square element planar antenna array. Each one of them is different than the other ones. So they're separated by some distance D, D sub X in one direction, D sub Y in the other direction. And there's a phase because of the current density in each one of them, not only the, the magnitude is different as well as the phase between them is different. So you learn, if you do take a class like 443 antenna on chapter six antenna theory, at least from my book or, on, uh, on a, or any book, if you take a, a class on arrays, uh, on uh, antennas, specifically on arrays, and some of you may have already taken or planning to take, hope you, hope you, you can take, or either at ASU or anywhere else. See so here are the different 
elements we have created an array four by four. And those are the specifics. I'm not gonna go through them. <clears throat> Time limitations. So that's the planar array. What happens is you can shift, okay? You can scan the beam away in any direction that you want to by controlling the phases of the patches, the phase difference between the patches. That's what you learn in 443, chapter six, let's say again, in, at ASU, if you use my book, all right? So, and we have equations that you can predict in which direction those maxima uh, are directed towards at theta sub zero and phi sub zero, the two spherical angles of each one of those maxima. And they're based on the, this is beta sub x is the phase difference between the elements in the x direction. Beta y is the phase difference between the elements in the, in the y direction. And of course the physical separation d sub x and d sub y, which control where the, where the maximum is. That's, that's what's happening. So when you illuminate this checkerboard surface, you actually create a planar array where there, there's a physical separation between the elements as well as there's a phase. Phase is the most critical part of it. This beta X and beta Y that control the direction that which the maximum exists. And now if you build the one, the previous one was square, this is hexagonal. Here's the pattern of a hexagonal. Now we have, we have created six major lobes instead of four major lobes because the, the physical geometry of the target now, instead of being square, this is hexagonal. And so you can imagine, we talked about flat circular. You can also, we have looked at curve, like cylindrical type. You can also, we also looked at spherical curved surfaces. So you imagine, that, for example, you can take a helicopter that we show in here, okay, an illustration of it, where you, you cover the surface. First of all, you make the geometry of the helicopter be less visible. So we talk about using um, geometry alteration to reduce the visibility. And then on top of that, you can cover it with this um, checkerboard type of surface to further reduce its visibility. Now, this is not happening right now. Don't we create an illusion, but this is something for the future, futuristic, look ahead, possibly application of it. Okay. So kind of in concluding here, um, faculty here in electrical engineering have published some books that were widely used. Uh, I'm one of them, the Antenna Theory book. This is the fourth edition, it's in color. Um, it was initially published in 1982. Um, we have, I think, what we think about 200, 2,000 universities are using it as a textbook. Uh, the, the second one here is the third edition. The fourth, first one is the fourth edition. Second one is the third edition. Uh, this is the EM book, which I already have shown you, which in the front we have the BF 117. The Nighthawk, the Lockheed Nighthawk. Uh, we have a small book on smart antenna published with one of my graduate students, for my graduate students. Uh, book, also a handbook on antenna, smart antenna book. A handbook, a book on fiber optics published by Professor Ballet, and a book on wavelets in electromagnetics and device modeling by Professor Pan. Again, one more time, the view of the our pride and joy at ASU, scale model helicopter in the ASU electromagnetic chamber. This facility, by the way, <clears throat> when we build it, cost millions of dollars, maybe seven, eight million. We didn't pay that much. We got a lot of contributions, but to build it today will be even more expensive. Okay, it's, it's in the A wing of the engineering complex if you ever visit in that direction. Okay, so with that, I want to thank you for your attention and I'd be most happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much.
Thanks, Dr. Bolanos. Um, students, if you have any questions for you, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, but yeah, thanks for your time for, for joining us. We appreciate it. Dr. Bolanos, have you gotten a ride in one of those jets? Uh, no, unfortunately not. <laughs> I, don't think I, I don't know if I can withstand it. Seeing some people, they have, um, I guess they have shown in the past, maybe some local reporters or so forth uh, took a ride in, uh, in those and uh, they had a bag with them. <laughs> yeah. I came here, I came here in 1955 in this country on a, on a boat because the airplanes went, didn't have a transatlantic flight. In 1955, I came on a boat, took 16 days. And uh, uh, just in the Mediterranean, before we got into the Atlantic Ocean, I, I needed a, a bag of bags <laughs> to unload. Uh, so I'm, I can imagine me taking a ride in one of these high performance uh, uh, aircraft. I would have needed maybe uh, uh, something uh, uh, much bigger than just a regular bag, okay? Yeah, yeah, they're getting more than a EMAG today. So thanks for the, the additional <laughs> details. So yeah, just so Nathan is just thanking you. He's thinking about EMAG as his pathway. And so Brandon said thanks for you. You're getting a couple of thank yous in here. So I guess you did all right. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Any, any questions? Oh yeah, so we, had, we do have one question from um, Jacob. He's asking, given I take Given I take EEE 341, are all EM technical electives open to me? Are there any that require more than one area pathway? I believe the answer is yes, 341 is the prereq for the rest of the EMAG courses. Um, I'd have to double check, but you can look at the website. No, that's um, correct. All, all the EM courses, well, in some of them, you, you can not, at least not recommend it that you go directly from 341, let's say, uh, if you want to take 543, which is the second course in antennas, for example, recommend that you take 443 first because 443 is prerequisite to 543. Same thing if you take, for example, 341, you can take um, uh, fiber optics 448. And then, you know, once you have that, you can take, let's say, 548, the follow up. But you definitely have to take to get started to, to anyone. Uh, so you have to take them in sequence if, if you wish, okay? You have to look at the prerequisites to each one of them. So uh, the 341 is prerequisite to, as a, one of my slides showed, uh, to 443, 448, 445. Once you take them, you can go now to the 500 level courses. Yeah, so just, um, you can always check our website for the course syllabus. Yes, absolutely, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then another student is asking your opinion on uh, would continuing on to a master's be recommended for this emphasis? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, so you, let me just say one thing. Let, let me just show you my experience. Now, I'm not, I haven't been in this business, you know, yesterday, 50, 50 and a half years teaching, full time teaching, and, and six years at NASA. Even when I was at NASA, I taught maybe two or three courses for George Washington University, okay? But part-time at that time. I was full-time with NASA. Um, you know, you're gonna sacrifice, when you go to graduate school, you're gonna sacrifice, you're gonna be on a, a low um, pay scale, if you wish, okay? For a couple of years to get a master's degree. But I can tell you, you can, you, the loss of revenue for two years, you go more than make it in maybe the first four or five years, uh, you, get a, uh, you get a job because your salary will be much higher because you have an advanced degree. Uh, if you go to a PhD, you're gonna have to sacrifice, I, I guess I put sacrifice in quotations, another four years maximum, let's say, three to four years extra beyond the master's. Or you can go to the direct PhD, which may last maybe four years. Depends, you know, what's your background, how fast you can perform and so forth. You know, students today, I can tell you based on some of my students and some of the other ones, recent hires, by Apple, Amazon, PhDs, fresh PhDs, no, no 
experience whatsoever other than graduate school. 120,000 plus benefits. We had, we had in electrical engineering during my tenure, had, a, had her in class, a female undergraduate student. I'm not gonna mention the name. Okay, got a job with a bachelor's degree. Now that's a rare case. That one, you know, to mislead you, you got a job with a bachelor's degree, 110,000 and about $50,000 stock benefits. Now those are, that, that was a rare case, but it happened. I know that because her boyfriend told me that. And I had that student again, took a couple of graduate level classes after she started working for the company in Seattle, Washington. So that's what I'm saying is, you, yes, you could sacrifice four or five years to go get a PhD, let's say, okay? But look, at you go bachelor's degree, I don't know what they're making today, 80, 90,000, depends on the company. You can make 120, maybe more, plus or minus, 120 plus or minus. Now you figure out how fast you can, if, if money is what's important, it's more than money. All right, I see another one here. I'm curious if the application of PMCs extend to potential bow interface. I'm, I'm tinkering with the concept of being able to read nerve signals and wirelessly control a prosthetic. What other, what other areas would you recommend studying? Well, uh, those surfaces may. Now I can I haven't worked in the area. I have, don't know that much about it, but. There are a lot of potential applications. Yes, the bioengineering, bioengineering related uh, applications have used, I have seen from the literature, from other people have published in, uh, in publications, IEEE publications have seen these surfaces are not just for scattering, are not for antennas. Bio-related applications are also utilizing such surfaces and many others, okay? So uh, what, other, what other areas would you recommend? Uh, I think, you know, obviously communications is very important, you know, electromagnetics and communications that go hand in hand together. So I think, yes, a good background in uh, communications is also highly recommended. Great, I think um, I think we're 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 just about out of time here. But I did want to, I did put in the chat a, a link to our four plus one program, which is an accelerated bachelor's to master's program for those interested in studying further. That's a a very economical and great way to get a master's degree if you want to stay on for it. Um, and uh, um, I did want to also say the. The recordings will be on our um, website. If uh, I'll try to put that link into the chat before ending, or if anybody else has that, um, please do. But um, thank you. So thank you, Dr. Blamas. Thank you for students for being active with your questions. We really appreciate it. And uh, I think I think it's over. I think it's a wrap. What do you think? It's up to you. I'm uh, I'm okay. Uh, if there <laughs> are any other questions, uh, people. Uh, I have a question, I'd be happy to answer any other questions. I know some of them have to leave if, uh, if anybody wants to stay. I know there's another one that I see, about the one is about the recording. I think you already addressed that. And in fact, I think here you already have it already. Um, now I'm, I've kind of <clears throat> missed any other one, uh, but I'd be more than happy to, let's see. Recording, are there any places you can find similar information, meaning uh, are there any place? Uh, the literature is full of information. If you look under uh, meta, meta surfaces, meta surf, meta means beyond in Greek. It's a, it, it, everything is Greek, of course, if you, if you watch the uh, big fat Greek wedding. Uh, and, <laughs> everything is related to Greek, okay? Yeah, somebody's laughing in the background. It's, I don't know who, uh, I don't know why they're laughing. I think this is very serious. You know, I'm serious of a person. Um, I'm not trying to advertise the Greek, of course. I'm not a Greek. Uh, I'm, I'm Greek from the old country, in fact. Uh, no, kidding. Uh, metasurfaces, uh, metamaterials. Okay. 
uh, artificial magnetic conductors, high impedance surfaces. Um, what are the uh, uh, many many designations? I think uh, that uh, people people use uh, work in this particular area. By the way, there's also not just electrical engineering publications, physics, other areas, physics, basic uh, uh, concepts introduced also in physics. So electrical engineering and physics go hand in hand, if, if you wish. So, so yes, there are many, many, many. This particular area got started about 25, 20 years ago, at least 20 years ago, when they introduced that basic a uh, high impedance surface that I was showing you, this synthesized uh, PMC surface, perfect magnetic conductor that, that I, I mentioned. In fact, it was a PhD dissertation by a young, uh, well, now it's a faculty member uh, at UCLA, okay, I think it was 1990 when that first uh, publication, <clears throat> all right? So there's, there's been a plethora of information in the literature. Meta surfaces, if you start with meta surfaces, meta materials, they will lead you to many, 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 many publications. You can go also to the publications that, that I showed you in, in the view graphs that we published, and those will lead you to other previous publications. Okay, so most happy, I think, yes, there's a plethora. Uh, let's see, what technical elective under EM do you recommend is helpful for students who will take power systems as the concentrations? Well, I think, uh, <clears throat> again, you only have a limited amount of time, so you can only take so many courses, otherwise you'll be at ASU forever. Uh, I would su suggest people in, in the power systems, uh, maybe uh, 241, which you have to take it anyway. You may go to 341. I don't think you need to go beyond that you know, for, for power systems. I think you can learn most of the EM concepts because you know power systems you know, deals with electromagnetic phenomena like corona, uh, discharging and so forth, all right? So I would say maybe taking to, um, 241, 341 should be sufficient. You can take the other ones for your own personal uh, uh, edification, but it depends how much time you have. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Is there another one? Yeah, let's see here. Okay, we talked about the recording. Well, I think that we're going to wrap it up if it's okay with you, Professor. No, I'm, it's, it's not okay with me. It's okay with you, though. <laughs> oh, it's it's up to you. No, I don't see too many more questions coming in. And uh, we are getting some participants that are leaving the room. Um, sure. Do you have anything else, though, that you'd like to add? or? No, I think thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for the invitation to give the presentation. I enjoyed Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Uh, any questions, you're going to be happy to answer it. And um, hope to see you again soon. We really appreciate well. you doing this. Thank, thanks for doing this. These are these are always great. Maybe this is recording is gonna be better than the last one. We'll update. Yes. You. Okay. I like the new presentation. Thanks for making that. Sure. Absolutely. Just you send me the money. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, Bob. Okay, Cheryl. Okay,